in St. Mary's Crumlin, which is being celebrated with the congregation and being recorded for our service for this Sunday, um, the 16th of August 2020. Lovely to have you with us. For those of you who are in the church, we'll be using our service sheets. But for those who are watching online, all the liturgy or the bits that you need to be part of will be up, uh, appear on the screen magically. I'll say the bits in blue and you respond with the sections in white. We start with our greeting. The Lord be with you. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us, and write these your laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Collect for this week. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your Church, open our hearts to the riches of his grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Bible reading today is our Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain top by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. Peter got out of his boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We reflect on God's word for a few minutes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we reflect on your word today to hear you speak to us in the midst of all that our lives hold this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So a little bit of background. Because this story comes in kind of the middle of John's Gospel, in the middle of a really, really busy time in the story of Jesus and the disciples. So, we're in Matthew chapter 14. People have discovered who Jesus is. They've seen, heard his amazing teaching. They've seen his miracles. Everywhere he goes, there's crowds. And you know and I know that that's all very tiring. And so in the previous chapter, Jesus had taken the disciples away to a quiet place for a time of refreshment, a time of renewal, a time together to discuss things. But Jesus was so popular and people wanted him to do the miracles and the healings that people followed them. And so when Jesus saw the crowds, he had pity on them and he taught them and he healed those who were ill. And then at the end of this day of dramatic crowds and teaching and healing, Jesus had said to the disciples, we better give them something to eat. And this is what we call the story of the feeding of the 5,000. You know what happens, don't you? The disciples say, look, we have nothing. Come on, we're at the edge of all we can cope with. What on earth are you doing to us? Now, it doesn't say that in the Gospels, but it doesn't take a genius to work that one out because they say, well, all we have is five loaves and two fish. And Jesus takes the little bit that they have, he breaks it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he shares it with everyone. And there's enough for everyone with loads left over. And so this was such a dramatic miracle, and there's a whole pile of other levels to it as well, but such a dramatic miracle that all the people there thought, this is the one God has sent, we want him to be king, and they're all ready to turn him into a king. And Jesus knows that that's not what his role is. And so that's where in the story we start in with our Bible reading today. He sends the disciples away so they don't get caught up in the middle of all of this and get used as pawns in the middle of a fight. So he puts them on the water out onto the lake, get them out of harm's way. And the Bible reading tells us that Jesus dismissed, Jesus then gets rid of the crowd, doesn't tell us how, and he goes up to the mountain to pray. So that's the background. The disciples have been sent away, they're in the middle of the lake, Jesus is praying, and there's a storm. So a couple of points to think about that. Firstly, the disciples were in the middle of a storm. Was that an accident? Was it an accident that they happened to be in the middle of the storm? Jesus knew where he was sending them. The Bible reading tells us that the wind was against them and that would bring in a storm. Was any of it a surprise to Jesus? We don't know. Secondly, Jesus was praying for them. So they're out in the middle of it and Jesus is up on the mountain praying. Jesus was praying for them. The Bible tells us not just that Jesus was praying for disciples then, but the Bible tells us that Jesus is now praying for each of us. That's what Jesus does now. He's in heaven, interceding, praying for us. We're never on our own in the middle of a storm, even if physically we are. Because God is with us by his Holy Spirit and Jesus is praying for us as he was praying for the disciples. And thirdly, Jesus will come to us in the middle of the storm. Do you know what we can often feel? And the scriptures are full of it. That when we're in the middle of a storm and a time of difficulty, we can so easily feel, oh well, God's not here, God's abandoned us, it's all, it's just whatever. Read the Psalms. Have a look at the Psalms. How many times in the Psalms it says, God, you've abandoned me. Why are you so far away? Why are you not in the middle of this storm with me? 
Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians, said that we were at one stage of his ministry, he and they were in such trouble that they felt that, um, they, felt that they despaired even for their lives. I wonder whether times in the letters to the Philippians, when Paul, in his, his arrest and prison, felt that perhaps God had abandoned him. But Jesus comes to us in the middle of the storms. Think about what has happened for the disciples. So we've traveled this journey. They've seen all the teaching, all the miracles, all the popularity. They were at the edge of what they could do and Jesus took the bit they had and used it to feed the whole crowd, the 5,000 plus women and children. And now in the midst of the storm, they're being tested. Do they really believe that Jesus can take care of them even when he's not with them? Because Jesus knew that the storms weren't going to just happen while he was with the disciples. That he was going to die and rise and return to heaven. And that they were going to have to face the storms after that on their own without him. They needed to know that Jesus would be with them and rescue them in the middle of those storms. Why did Jesus come walking on water? Why did he not just climb into the boat? Is there something powerful about the fact that it was the water and the waves that the disciples were most afraid of and Jesus walked on those. They became the ladder to enable him to come and rescue them. Or was Jesus showing them that he was in charge of everything that they were afraid of? Why did they not recognize Jesus? Why did the disciples in the days after Jesus rose from the dead, when they met with him, why did they not recognize him? Because they were looking out at the winds and the waves in fear. What they saw was all that was coming at them and they and their felt their fear. And they weren't looking out to see Jesus coming in faith. There is always the challenge in the midst of a storm, whatever it may be, the challenge is always who or what do we look at or look for? Are we looking at the waves? Are we looking at the trouble? Are we focusing on all of that? Or are we looking out, knowing that Jesus is praying for us, knowing that God will come to us, knowing that God will get us through, looking out for how God is answering our prayers. Because if we're looking only at the storm, it's really hard to see God at work. They weren't expecting to see Jesus walking on the water. And you might be expecting the difficult neighbour or whoever it might be to be the person whom God has sent in the midst of your storm today. We so often pray and I think we so often don't look for how God is working. Yes, maybe the miraculously. Yes, maybe the equivalent of Jesus walking on the water, but often it's the little boy who has five loaves and two fishes that may be the answer to our prayers. So what can we learn from this story of the midst of this storm? And whatever storm you might be going through, and the storm that we're all in the midst of, that uncertainty with all the COVID stuff. Number one, we can know that it's not a surprise to God. God knows all that's going on. In the big story and in the little story. Know that God, that Jesus is praying for us. That God is with us. That God comes to us in the middle of the storm. And through that storm, he can very well strengthen our faith for whatever the next storm may be. Let's take a moment of quiet. Perhaps 
sharing with God how we feel in the midst of the storm that we're in today and asking for his help. Lord Jesus, so often we can tend to look at the wind or feel the wind and look at the waves and know how small we are in the middle of whatever today's crisis may be. And we look out with fear and not with faith. Help us as we pray to know that you are praying with us and that you hear and answer our prayers. And help us to see you at work in our world, whether in the small ways or in the big dramatic ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue in prayer, praying particularly for that faith within the midst of the storms of life around us. So we continue in prayer. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we pray for your church in this time of storm. We pray for your church in this community, in this land and throughout our world. Give us always your wisdom. Give us always your grace, your courage to look not to the difficulties and the storm around us, but to keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, in these days of COVID, this storm that rages throughout our world and in our land, we pray for all who are in the eye of the storm. We pray though, particularly for those who, like the disciples in the boat on that night, feel so very vulnerable. We pray for those who may be on the edge looking out and seeing that boat and feeling very nervous. We pray for all who work and serve in whatever way to bring healing and hope in the midst of those storms. We pray for the work of the scientists throughout the world and we pray for all who are decision makers in our world. Lord, in your mercy, We pray also for other storms in life, whether for us personally or as families, or whether within other circumstances. And so we remember, particularly in prayer today, those who are caught up in the storms in Beirut, in Belarus, and in many other places where there may be civil unrest, and particularly those places caught up in storms at this time. We pray for those who are uncertain about their economic future. We pray for those who have businesses and are not sure what will happen next. We ask in Jesus' name that you will bring your word of hope and faith in the midst of these troubles. And you will send the right people to do the right work. Lord, in your mercy. In a time of quiet, we bring name before God those known to us who need God's healing, strengthening touch this day. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are ill, whether in hospital at home or in nursing homes. We pray for those who care for them. We pray for all within the medical services. We pray for those whose treatment has been delayed because of the COVID crisis. We pray for those who are in the last season of their earthly life. Lord, in your mercy, 
in a time of quiet we bring our own particular prayers and requests before God. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, thank you that you hear and answer our prayer. Give us faith in the midst of the storm to hold on in the sight of fear and look for you at work through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We'll now have our hymn, which is the great traditional hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Praise to you, Lord. 
Lord Jesus Christ, dying you destroyed our death, rising you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Holy Spirit, giver of life, come upon us now. May this bread and wine be to us the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us who know our need of grace, one in Christ our risen Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, with your whole church throughout the world we offer you this sacrifice of thanks and praise. And we lift our voice to join the song of heaven, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. Amen, Amen, Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We pray the prayer after communion together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.